morning. Go ahead and grab your Bible and join me in Galatians chapter 1. Certainly appreciate those from Union who have led us so well this morning. Let's just go ahead and express our appreciation to them again. And Mike, I really want to learn how to do that. Where are you? Michael, can I? I mean, that's, it's a bunch of spit and stuff going everywhere. I just, I would, I would love a couple of lessons. I don't know if they're doing that over at Union, but um, Dr. Kinchin, let's see if we can make that happen. Um, well, this is Missions Mobilizations Month for us here at West Jackson. And this is the month of the year where we're not just communicating and displaying all the ways that we're connected and involved around the world and what God is doing. What a privilege that is, but also it's the month where we want to get you out of your seat and we want to get you involved. And so every testimony that you see come across this screen from Paul in Paris to um, the group that goes down to RIFA or helps with Room in the Inn, our ultimate goal, we want to tell you up front, is that you would be involved, that you would be a part. We are a gospel community that is on mission together, and so um, the church uh, to say you're involved in missions means that you're actively involved. It doesn't just mean that you go to a church that puts a high priority on missions. We want you to go. We want you to experience the joy of what it means to, to take the gospel to the nations and take the gospel to our neighborhoods. And so over the next few weeks, you'll continue to hear testimonies about what God is doing around the world and uh, what we're uh, getting to be a part of. Well, this morning we're going to begin a new series on the book of Galatians, and so glad you're here. If this is your first Sunday here, we want to welcome you. I hope you felt welcome and enjoyed the experience so far. Um, but this, uh, this season, uh, at least for me, there's been a lot of weddings, and uh, I don't know if you've been to any weddings this fall or not, but there's certainly been, it seems like more than usual. And after the wedding ceremony, there's a reception. And when I was uh, younger, typically the reception is we you went down to the Fellowship Hall and you had some punch and some mints and some peanuts and some cake, and that was it. And as a father of three daughters, I appreciate that. I appreciate the simplicity <laughs> of the old school wedding reception. If we could bring that back around, that would be fantastic. But... Um, Nowadays, uh, people go down, there's a whole meal, there's usually a DJ, and there's people that are gathered together and they're creatively moving. And for us Baptists, we call that, dan no, non-Baptists call that dancing, um, but for us, we call it creative moving. And every now and then, a, a certain song, I'm, I'm usually carrying on the sidelines watching things go down, and um, every now and then, there's a song that kind of everybody goes out on the dance floor. You know, everybody knows the song, and it's, uh, what I've noticed is they're typically line dances, and so a line dance, if you don't know what that is, it's, it's a song that's, I guess, choreographed more than others, so if you're a Baptist, you can feel more freedom to go out there in that one because it's, it's choreographed, and you have people in lines, and they're, they're dancing, and, and it feels a little safer, right? If you don't have any rhythm, uh, a line dance like that says choreographed feels a little safer. And so more people go out on the floor and they're moving in the same way, moving in the same direction, or at least they're supposed to. But every now and then you look out there, as I'm observing, I notice there are some people who are a little off. There are some people who don't know the song as well as others, and perhaps they don't really know the dance. And so they're the ones who are always just a little bit out of step. Uh, they, am, they may accidentally turn left when everybody else is turning right, or they may be just a little behind on a spin or, or a clap or a turn. They're trying to copy what they see everyone else doing, so uh, they're a little behind. They don't really know the song personally, and they're always, throughout the entire song, they're always just a little out of step. And I think in the church, we can be the same way. I think there are many people in the church who are just a little out of the step. Not out of step with kind of being together, but out of step with the gospel. I think it's possible that many of us, as we gathered here, we're just mimicking what we see. We're walking into a place like this, and whether it be the behavior or, or whatever it may be, the lifestyle, many people come into the church and they simply just copy what they see. They don't really know the song, 
They don't really know the, the lyrics. They don't really know the moves of the, of the gospel. And so they're always just a little behind because they're taking their cues from other people. They know there's freedom in Christ, but they don't experience freedom in Christ. They, they, we walk in here and we sing about grace, but they're still trapped into thinking that God loves them based on their performance. And that can be all of us, can it? I mean, we can all know the gospel intellectually. We can all know the doctrines of the gospel and yet not love the one who has given us the gospel, not love the one who has given us these doctrines, these truths that we sing about and and that we celebrate. And it's possible for us to come in here or even um, on our best weeks and just be a little out of step to watch other people worship and then join in and mimic what they do and sing what they sing and not truly be singing it from our own personal experience as those who truly know the gospel. Over the next few weeks as we walk through the book of Galatians, we're going to be focusing on just that, the, the gospel and what is the gospel and Paul's defense of the gospel and how it changes us, how we get in step with the gospel. And so this morning, we're going to look here in these first five verses of Galatians. And uh, let me give you a little background as we begin. Paul's first missionary journey was to the churches in the region of Galatia, which would have been modern-day Turkey. And after Paul planted the churches, there were Jews that came in, Judaizers, who came in and were undermining Paul and his ministry. Um, these Judaizers were saying basically that uh, they wanted to come in and they wanted the Gentiles, and Gentiles were non-Jews. And so they were going into these Jewish, mostly Gentile churches in Galatia, and they were telling the Gentiles, the non-Jews, that they had to follow Jewish customs, customs, like they had to follow the dietary laws, or they had to follow the Jewish rituals, or even be circumcised. And not only that, but they were also undermining Paul's ministry and his credibility. They were saying that he wasn't one of the apostles. He wasn't preaching a complete gospel. He was preaching a gospel that was separated from his Jewish roots. And so Paul is writing this letter to these churches that he loves dearly, these believers in Galatia, to combat these um, untruths. Uh, to protect these people that were beginning to lose their zeal for a gospel and turn to a gospel, which Paul will say later on in the next few weeks, it's not even a gospel at all. And so Paul wrote this letter, and it was meant to be circulated amongst the churches. There were several churches there in the region of Galatia. And so this letter was to be read in one particular church, and then it would be passed on to the next church and, and read in the next church. And so let's read these words together and hear these words of um, God as, Paul, as he is speaking through Paul, his servant. In verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle, not from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to him be the glory forever and ever. As we start this book, I want you to know who Paul is. And Paul is revealing himself here in the first few verses when he says, Paul, he's an apostle. And he says, not from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. This was customary in ancient letters that you would um, actually say who is writing the letter from the very beginning. You would let them know. And so that's what Paul is doing here. But Paul is not only identifying himself, he's also making a point because his credentials had been undermined by these Judaizers. And Paul knows that in order to defend the gospel that he preached, he feels he must first defend his calling to preach it. And so Paul first, he identifies himself as an apostle. Now, the the word apostle simply means one who has been sent out, a messenger. Um, But Paul here is saying more than that. He's saying not only is he just one who's been sent out, but he's been directed by Christ himself. He's claiming to be an apostle uh, uh, with a capital A, like the other 12 apostles. 
directly appointed by Jesus, not for men or by man, but by Jesus Christ and the God Father who raised him from the dead. And, and then as he goes through chapter 1 and 2 here, Paul is kind of sharing the story about his calling. And so let's look down in, in, at his calling. And I want to give you a little bit of timeline. As we think through the, the book of Galatians and just Paul's life, I want to give you a little bit of context here for when it was written. And we're going to do that by walking through Paul's story as he shares it here in chapter 1. Look down in verse 11. And he says, For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel preached by me is not of human origin, for I did not receive it from a human source, and I was not taught it, but it came by a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard about my former way of life in Judaism. I intensely persecuted God's church and tried to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many contemporaries among, for, among my people because I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. But when God, who from my mother's womb set me apart and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I could preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. I did not go up to Jerusalem to those who had become apostles before me. Instead, I went to Arabia and came back to Damascus. So Paul, first of all, says, listen, I was somebody who was there. My, my gospel, I didn't receive it from a human source. I received it directly. It was revealed to me as Jesus Christ appeared to me on the road to Damascus. You know, I have uh, four kids at home. And if you have four kids at home, on a daily basis, accusations go flying, okay? Okay. Uh, throughout the day, there are all kinds of accusations, and I've learned that my kids are capable of terrible things. But in order for me to prove those terrible things, typically one of the things that I'll ask is, okay, did you, did you see him do it? Did you see her do it? Did you see her hit her? Did you see who left this stain, massive stain on the carpet? Did you see who left, you know, uh, their, their computer out in the front lawn. I mean, did you see, I need an eyewitness here. Because a, an eyewitness, right, it gives validity to, to what's taking place. And so Paul is saying here, listen, I'm an apostle. I was an eyewitness. And if you remember, that was one of the things that was listed, one of the credentials that was needed for someone who was going to be called an apostle, like the 12, is it had to be somebody who was an eyewitness, and so Paul here is claiming that he was an eyewitness, that he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. And so let me give you this timeline. Um, in 30 through 33 A.D., that's the time that Jesus, of Jesus' death and resurrection, okay? And then shortly after that, in 33 through 36, so uh, you might have thought that Paul's um, uh, experience, conversion experience happened way later, but actually it was within probably five years, three to, three to five years of Jesus' death and resurrection. And so Jesus confronts Paul. If you remember, Paul was a, a Pharisee persecuting the church. And Jesus on the road to Damascus confronts Paul, and he's converted. And he sees Jesus as the, the, the Messiah, the, the Son of God. And he goes to Damascus. He's uh, blinded there on the road uh, to Damascus. And he goes to Damascus. He's healed. And then Scripture tells us, he tells us here in Galatians chapter 1, that he heads back into Damascus. He goes into Arabia. And Arabia, many scholars would say that when Paul goes to Arabia, he goes to Mount Sinai, which is the same place that, that God met Moses, the same place where God met Elijah. And so there on that mountain, we, we believe that Paul was receiving these revelations from God. He was being shaped and formed and, and being taught by God to be sent out. And so from that point on, Paul began preaching the gospel in Damascus. And that's where we pick up in verse 18 here in Galatians chapter 1. And it says, then after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to get to know Cephas and I star Peter. And I stayed with him 15 days. But I didn't see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And I declare in the sight of God, I'm not lying in what I write to you. And so Paul ends up in Damascus or ends up in Jerusalem. He's uh, in 36 AD. He makes the trip from Damascus to Jerusalem because in Damascus he is being persecuted. And so if you look in Acts chapter 9, you see the story. They actually lower 
Paul down by a rope and a basket there from Damascus so that he can sneak out of the city at night. He goes to Jerusalem. And while in Jerusalem there, he, uh, the disciples were afraid of Paul. Uh, they only knew him as a persecutor of the church. And so they thought, well, this could be some grand trick. We're not going to trust Paul. And yet Barnabas, however, took him in. Barnabas the encourager. And Barnabas brought him to the apostles. But after just a short time there in Jerusalem, um, the Jews wanted to kill Paul there also. And so they send him from Jerusalem. They send him back to Tarsus. And that's where we pick up here in verse 21. It says, and afterward, I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I remained personally unknown to the Judean churches that are in Christ. They simply kept hearing that he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. And so they sent him back to Tarsus, and Paul begins preaching in those areas. And so from 36 to 44, uh, about eight years, Paul preaches in Tarsus and the surrounding area. And then in 44 through 46, we know this from Acts chapter 11, um, Barnabas is in Antioch, remember, and he calls for Paul. God is doing a work there amongst the Gentiles in Acts chapter 11. And so Barnabas says, hey, I need Paul. So after eight years of preaching around the Tarsus area, Paul goes up to Antioch and joins Barnabas again. And there at Antioch, from 47 to 48, they're sent on their first missionary journey to Cyprus and Galatia. And that first missionary journey there where Paul was preaching to the churches that we believe the book of Galatians was written to. And so as he goes around preaching in these churches, many Gentiles are responding to the gospel. Now, we're Gentiles, right? Unless you're a Jew, you're a Gentile. And so this is no big deal to us. But if you're a Jew at this time, I mean, Jesus was a Jew. This was kind of a, uh, even though it was uh, about Jesus, this was still in their eyes a Jewish religion. That in order to come to know Christ and to truly be saved, to become a Jewish Christian, you had to become a Jew. And so when all these Gentiles begin responding to the gospel, the Jews didn't really know what to do. Because the Gentiles, Paul wasn't commanding them to follow their customs and so they had a convention, right? Because a convention makes everything better. And so they, they pulled them all together. They had a big, big convention, big council there in Jerusalem in 49 AD. And that's what we see Paul referring to here in Galatians chapter 2. Let's read these verses together. It says, then after 14 years, Paul says, I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also, and I went up according to a revelation and presented to them the gospel I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were recognized as leaders. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running in vain, but not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers has in, had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus in order to enslave us. We did not give up and submit to these people for even a moment so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved for you. So what is Paul talking about? He's talking exactly what he's writing about here in the book of Galatians. He's, these false teachers came to the church or trying to lead the Gentile Christians astray saying they had to be circumcised, saying they need to follow these Jewish customs. In verse 6, he goes on, he says, Now from those recognized as important, once they once were, makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to me. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter was for the circumcised. And since the one at work in Peter for an apostleship to the circumcised was also at work in me for the Gentiles, when James, Cephas, and John, those recognized as pillars, acknowledged the grace that had been given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to me and Barnabas, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they, and they to the circumcised. They only asked that we would remember the poor, which I had made every effort to do. And so Paul says there, while he was in Jerusalem at this council, they had to, to settle on some things. And what was settled was this, is that Peter, James, and John, these leaders in the church of Jerusalem, it's not that their word all of a sudden gave credibility to Paul. No, Paul says this, they acknowledged what God had already done in my life. They acknowledged the calling upon my life and this gospel that I was 
that I was preaching was true. In the same way that God called Peter and James and John to go out and and spread the gospel to the Gentiles, they see that God himself has set me apart. In in fact, he says that in in chapter 1 in in verse, uh, verse 15, he says, But when God, who from my mother's womb set me apart and called me by his grace, was pleased. You know, the Pharisees... In the days of Jesus, they believed that they were set apart by God, that they were holier than others because of their observance of the law. But Paul is saying, listen, I'm set apart not by the law but by grace, God's grace. He thought on the road to Damascus that he was set apart by observing the law. But in that moment, he understood who Jesus was and the sin in his life. And he said, I stand here, listen, not because of the law, but because of God's grace. I've been set apart while I was still in my mother's womb by the grace of God. This is my confidence. This is my identity. Uh, This is who I am. This is my story. And Paul wasn't going to be tossed about by the opinions and the approval of men or ever-changing circumstances, my friends. And we don't either. For those of us who would say, yes, we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, that we have been saved by grace through faith. We also, we have our confidence in in this God who's called us and saved us, and we don't have to be tossed and turned by the circumstances of the world, by other people's opinions. No, our identity, our confidence is rooted in this call. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, it says, For he who chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. My friends, what God says about you, Christian, what what God has done for you always trumps what other people say or, or even how you feel about yourself. Paul's confidence here was in the calling of God and the gospel message that he proclaimed. And in verses 3 through 5, he proclaims this message right at the beginning of his letter. Paul doesn't hold back. Look again what he says. He says, grace to you and peace from God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age. F.F. Bruce writes this, that this is the probably the earliest written statement about the significance of the death of Christ. These words are written, they're probably a creed that was passed on that Paul is repeating. And so here we have, I mean, 20 years or so after the the death of Jesus, Paul giving testimony to his death and the fact that he's alive, he's now risen. No no time for legendary status. I mean, these were were facts as eyewitnesses saw them and passed them down to others. These were facts as Paul proclaims him here to the Galatians as one who'd met the risen Christ. And notice how he begins. He says the the who of the gospel is Jesus. The who of the gospel is Jesus. He says, grace to you and peace from God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself. The gospel is is ultimately centered around this person of, of Jesus. It's the avenue through which Jesus made for us to come into a relationship with God the Father. And so the gospel here is is centered on a person. Uh, You know, every now and then I'll I'll do a a wedding and in the premarital counseling, I'll discover something that disturbs me a little bit. And it's this, it seems that the the couple is in, in Brides, I'm going to pick, you, pick on you a little bit. It's usually the bride, uh, they seem to be all about the wedding, but not really focused on the marriage. And that's a bad idea to get married for a wedding. A wedding lasts about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, the, the whole day, you know, lasts a little longer. But a marriage, a relationship lasts for a lifetime. And in the same way, I got you fired up this morning. Um, And in the same way, listen, our relationship with God, uh, the the gospel is, is the entry point for us to have a relationship with Christ himself. 
The gospel is not just a prayer, then we get baptized and we move on with life however we see fit. No, uh, the gospel is about God reconciling us to Himself through Jesus Christ. This is the good news. The gospel is the good news about what God has done through Jesus to bring us into relationship with Himself. So the who of the gospel is that you've been brought into a relationship with, with Jesus Himself. You know, for a long time, I confused early on in, in my Christian walk, I confused the gospel with, with the benefits of the gospel. And there are lots of benefits for the gospel. The gospel, listen, uh, but the gospel is not the sum of its benefits. The gospel is not say a prayer and you go to heaven. The gospel is not, hey, come to know Jesus and God will fix all your problems. The gospel is not simply God loves you no matter what. The gospel is not only that God forgives you. The gospel is not simply live a pure and moral life. I mean, those things may demonstrate the power of the gospel. But the gospel is about a relationship with Jesus. And if we're going to be in step with the gospel, we need to be in step with a, with a daily relationship with Christ. And this relationship is based upon what Christ has done. And that's what we see Paul saying there in verse 4. He said, who gave himself. Jesus gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age. And so the who of the gospel is Jesus. The what of the gospel is Jesus gave himself for our sins to rescue us. Jesus gave himself. This is, Christianity is the only religion where God gives himself. Buddhism gives you an eightfold path. Islam, there's five pillars that you have to obey and adhere to. Hinduism is a religion that gives us 33 million gods who have 33 million way, different ways you have to please those gods so that God will be pleased with you. But in Christianity, God gives himself. Jesus came. What you see in the pages of the gospel is, is not a great man or a teacher who lived an exemplary life who was forced to die on a cross. What you see in the gospels is God the Son laying down his life for you. His life was not taken from him. It was laid down by him for you. Jesus gave himself to, listen, he laid down his life to rescue us. Paul would write, from our sins. You may think, well, I didn't need to be rescued from my sins, but Scripture would say that, that we do. Because sin is not just an act. It's not just a one-time thing that we do. Sin is a condition. We don't, we don't sin, and therefore we're sinners. No, we're sinners, and therefore we, we sin. And in our sin, in this condition, we cannot save ourselves. We're in a hopeless position that our, listen, that our rescue depends completely upon someone else. Our rescue has to be an inside job. It's not just an external fix. It can't be done by our hard work, our performance. It has to be uh, uh, something done, on the, a healing on the inside. We have to be made new. And we're not gathered here this morning simply because we've decided to, to follow the teachings of Jesus or the example of Jesus. That's not why the church gathers together. Uh, Timothy Keller says this, you don't throw a drowning woman a manual on how to swim. You throw her a rope or a life preserver. And my friends, we're sinners. We're drowning. And so we need a Savior. And what Paul is proclaiming here is that our salvation came about not because we did anything in and of ourselves, but because Jesus came while we were helpless. This is what he writes in Romans chapter 5. He says, for while we were still helpless at the appointed time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, through, but for a good person, 
Perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And what Paul will show us in the book of Galatians over and over and over again is that we cannot add a thing to what Christ has done. But our temptation, oh, our, our, our desire, the sin in us so much wants to prove ourselves to God. Or we want to take advantage of this grace of God. But ultimately, we can't add one thing to the gospel. All we can do is what Paul says here in verse 5. When he says, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That word amen there, we say it all the time. It's basically a transliteration of a Hebrew word signifying something that is certain or it's true. And so when we say amen, we say, yes, this is true. We believe it. We know this is true. We want, to, we want to live our lives and step with it. And, and Martin Luther, who loved the book of Galatians, it was his favorite book in the Bible. He said, but, you know, before you ever read anything that I've written, make sure you've read, written, read Galatians. I think it's either 1,000 or 10,000 times. Martin Luther said that he would, if he could marry a book of the Bible, right, he would marry the book of Galatians. Those are his words, not mine. And this is what Martin Luther says about the word amen. He says, you must always speak the amen firmly. Never doubt. And so I thought we would do that this morning in closing together. And so I want to read back through these words of Paul in Romans chapter 5. And I want us to say amen together with certainty like we mean it. This is what Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, verse 6. He says, for while we were still helpless, at the appointed moment, Christ died for the ungodly. Amen. Amen. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. Amen. Amen. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. 